true crime podcast where best friends and next door neighbors, Willow and Lillian, spill the tea on murder, mysteries, and other things that go bump in the night. So get your favorite teacup ready and let's get into it. Welcome to Cruelty Podcast. This is Lillian, and with me is Maris. Hello. Because it's Maris Monday. Yeah. Yeah, and we're continuing on with our missing 411 stuff. Cool. And I, w- I wanted to first do a couple cases that were kind of like, meh, you know, clearly yeah. not. But this one is so weird. Okay. It's so weird. I'm pumped. Yeah, I just... To me, I used to think this was just about the scariest paranormal thing out there. I remember in the good days of Coast to Coast, it was the best show. On, oh, yeah. you tune in and you were like on the edge of When they're of doing the seat. Missing 411 episodes, I was like, well, man. But as I looked more into it, I found that most of the cases seemed pretty easy to explain away. Yeah. However, there are a set of about 10 to 12 cases that are just so weird mm-hmm. that I like debunkers have tried. Nobody can figure these out. They don't make any sense. All right. And this is one. And I was going to cover another one, but I realized I covered at least part of it in another episode. Okay. So this is the Jim McGrogan case. All right. Cool. Now, before getting starting started on this case, uh, I'm going to go ahead and lay out the criteria of what makes a, ca- a missing persons case a missing 411 case. Mm-hmm. This was created by David Polites. I'm not going over who he is again. Just search for our Missing 411 episodes and listen to all of them, and then you can know. Because I'm not going over the same information a million times. It's annoying. Okay, so first, most of the victims who go missing are male. Mm -hmm. They are not usually in the best health, although they can be kind of prime specimens or, like, fucked up. Mm -hmm. Either very high or very low intelligence And last, they are white and of German heritage, usually. And, of course, there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. As for natural features of the area these people go missing in, berry patches, boulder fields, running water nearby, high elevation, and nearby caves often feature prominently. Another factor is that people in these cases typically vanish sometime in the mid-afternoon, and they vanish in close proximity to other people. Mm -hmm. A kind of, they were just a couple steps behind me thing. Right. Like you turned your head. Exactly. Now for this case, it could be either or. Like it's weird. Okay. Another component of the missing 411 phenomenon is where a body is located, if it's located at all. It will be in a strange location, a location searched many times before. Usually at high elevation, the body will be in an odd position or very, very, very far from where they went missing. But in most cases, bodies aren't found. And often when bodies are found, their remains bring more mystery and usually don't give a cause of death. Right. Like, we'll always just go with exposure, but, you know. Right. Their clothes will be weird, like put on backwards, Mm -hmm. or they're not as decomposed as they should be. Also, dogs will fail to track these people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when the person is found alive... They absolutely cannot remember what happened to them at all. Yeah. Today's story is about the disappearance of Dr. Jim McGrogan, an ER surgeon from northwestern Indiana in Chesterton. Jim graduated high school in 1993 and went on to attempt admittance to medical school three times. And he got third times the charm. He got He was very dedicated. (laughs) I would have given up (laughs) after the first one. Oh, me too. Yeah. He went on to become an ER doctor, and he was well-liked in his community. He was loved by family and friends and considered to be a great doctor. All right. Close friends of Jim said he was an amazing person with an adventurous spirit. Jim was a very experienced outdoorsman, hiker, and snowboarder. Jim was purported to be in prime physical condition. He was a marathon runner and a long-distance biker, so he was the king of exercise. Right. He was a doctor and the best at exercise. Jeez, I am the opposite of this man. Oh, yeah, me too. Yeah. Winded when taking a shower. Dropped out of art college and very out of shape. <laughs> yeah, I'm just not. Uh, I'm maybe, maybe not very. I'm just being <laughs> self-deprecating. But I don't, I'm, not, I'm not no marathon runner. No, I think you could go on a small hike. Yeah, I have, and I do, yeah. I could not. No, for not, not not because you have a bad knee, though. I am disabled, yes. Yeah. 
So before, okay, so in 2013, Jim and three of his friends started planning a challenging hiking trip to Vail, Colorado. Like once they get to Vail, mm-hmm. they're not going to like hike to Vail from Well, Indiana. that'd be really hard. I'd be done after that. <laughs> yeah, no. So I want to talk a little about Colorado's history, especially the history of this area. And the reason I want to do that is no one ever does. Okay. So before Colorado was colonized in the 1880s by white gold and silver miners, it was inhabited by the Ute Indians, and the Ute called themselves the Nauchi U. So the the Ute is the name that was given to them by the Spanish. Okay. So they're actually the Because I heard of the Ute, yeah. Yeah. The Ute uh, occupied Utah and Colorado. Utah is named Utah after the Ute people. Okay. Yes. They migrated to that area from the California Nevada region once they were pushed out of there. See a theme, colonizers. Yeah. They were nomadic in Colorado and they moved through one area to hunt and trap large and small game before settling in another area for winter. The Ute traded with many, many other indigenous tribes and had a, like a very extensive trade network that all, went all the way to Mexico. Mm hmm. In 1845, with the Treaty of Hidalgo, the lands owned by the Ute were given over to the United States. And it was the Mormons that caused all the problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Mormons thought the Ute were a lost tribe of Hebrews. Oh, you guys are And I wanted to include this because of just this little bit is so stupid. Yeah, it's weird. Now, the Ute were very big into slave trade. Uh-huh. They would raid other tribes. They would, t- you know, take people and sell them to Mexico. Right. And the Mormons did not like this. And I just want to say to the Mormons, hey, I agree. Slavery, slavery bad. Right. But also, you're bad. <laughs> so shut up. Right. You're both bad. There's a lot of bad going on. Yes. So, yeah, that caused to a lot of fighting between the Mormons and the Utes. Mm-hmm. And after many sc- Skirmishes and raids, the Ute were relegated to two reservations in Colorado, and in between these two reservations is Vail. Okay. The Vail Mountain Pass has been named an archaeological site for the Ute. Okay. And so I wanted to give that history because I want you to just picture all of this beautiful, like, natural, untouched land. Right. And then, like, the most touristy, white people yuppie bullshit you've ever seen Mm -hmm. now look i've been to Vail several times and i think it's beautiful i truly do it is a beautiful place the mountains around it are beautiful but boy is it expensive and ridiculous yeah i've never been it just it just feels like a tourist town like every nothing is made there there's a lot of turquoise jewelry that looks plastic it's just i don't know it has this sort of is there a vibe it doesn't have a great vibe. Hmm. Okay. It has a very commercialized vibe. Okay. Now, to be fair, the last time I was there was like 1995. I've just never been to Colorado. I've been many times. It's one of my favorite states in the Union. Yeah. It's so beautiful. But it's it's very wild and yeah. untamed. Yeah. I've, always, I've flown over it. It's it's just lovely. Moving on with our story, Jim and his friends went to Vail for their long-awaited and meticulously planned trip. He first stopped at a shop that sold skiing equipment, and here he rented a split board. Now, a split board is like skis that you can connect together that become a snowboard. Okay. And then he got skins for these, and that helps you go uphill okay. in skis. So it's like for backcountry, cross-country skiing. Gotcha, yeah. So you use them as skis when you walk uphill. Use it as a snowboard when you go down. I, I've been cross-country skiing once. Bullshit. It's really hard. Hurts. It does no, hurt. Thank you. In addition to these things, he had a shovel. Jim was very, very prepared for this hike. Now, that was all of his rented equipment. Anything else that we talk about in this episode is equipment Jim owned himself as an experienced hiker. Yeah, it sounds like he's got his shit together. Yes. Jim was carrying a large hiking backpack that contained food, water, medical supplies, a GPS device, a cell phone, an extra cell phone battery, warm clothes, and other tools. Mm -hmm. And I think... I think he had enough food with him for many days, like four or five days. Right. Jim's group planned to hike up to a place called Iceman's Hut. It's a small cabin with beds and a wood stove, and it sits at about 11,000 feet in elevation. It's a place for hikers and hunters to rest on their journeys. Jim's group began the hike 
at 8 a.m. on Friday, March 14th, 2014. It was 19 degrees, mm-hmm. so it was cold. Mm-hmm. But the sky was clear and the weather was good. Ooh, when the sky's clear, it's colder. I know, but the Ooh. weather was very good. Yeah. Jim texted his wife as they started the hike, and it was a selfie with the other guys in the group, and the caption said, the adventure begins. Mm -hmm. And I believe that is the last time his wife heard from him. Oh, it's sad. Well, this case is very sad. Yeah. Sometime between 9.30 and 10.30 a.m. that very same morning, news reports that covered Jim's case say the group decided to stop and take a rest. This will be contradicted later. Mm -hmm. Jim didn't need to rest. Because as mentioned before, he was in excellent physical shape. He decided to keep going and meet them at another rest stop or at Iceman's Hut. It was 27 degrees with calm winds and fairly Mm -hmm. clear skies. Yeah. His friends were reported to be upset with him for insisting on going alone and not waiting for them to That upset me too. In fact, they even told him your wife said not to go wandering off by yourself. Mmm, Jimmy. But this may not have happened. I don't think it did, actually. Sorry. No, it's fine. You sneezed, and it's just... Look, y'all, our allergies have been nuts. Mm-hmm. We're barely alive. I yeah. know I sound funny. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm I mean, dying. I'm not saying that, but... When the group was surprised... The group was surprised when they didn't catch up to Jim on the trail. Mm-hmm. They didn't take that long of a rest, probably like 10, 15 minutes. So they absolutely did expect him to be at the hut at around 5.30 p.m. when they arrived and were shocked when they found he wasn't there. And immediately they called the police. At this point, Jim's not really even missing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's late showing up. And oftentimes in these cases, people do dumb things like wait before Mm -hmm. calling or the police tell them to go fuck themselves, which is another thing that happens, but not in this case. Right. Okay. During the period of separation, Jim did make a single phone call for 16 seconds, according to cell phone records. However, no records have been released to the public as to who this call was to or from, whether anyone answered. We just know there was 16 seconds of cell phone activity while he was missing. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Jim's group took the Sprattle Creek Trail, which, like, cut across great swaths of wilderness. It wasn't a well-traveled trail, but it is the winter route. So that means especially up to Iceman's Hut. That means while during the like spring and summer and fall, this trail won't look well-traveled. It looks super well-traveled in the winter okay. because people cut through all that snow and yeah. beat down a path. Right. Yeah. It is possible Jim took another trail. Because of recently passed laws in Colorado, a search for Jim began immediately, and it was an intense search and very professional with lots of resources. Why? Well, normally in these cases, we see a sort of slapdash effort until the person has been missing for some time, but this is Vail, and it's a tourist hotspot with lots of wealthy residents, so the search and rescue was top-notch, well-funded, and ready to go. Hmm. They had a 50% success rate retrieving people alive from the wilderness. That doesn't seem very high until you realize it's the fucking wilderness. Right. And that they have 50% success rate is actually some of the highest in the world. So just let you know. They should have yeah. found him is what yeah. I'm saying. Fail Mountain Search and Rescue immediately sent four search teams to hunt for Jim. They were assisted by Eagle County Sheriff's Department, the Colorado National Guard, Alpine Rescue, Rocky Mountain Rescue, and the Larimer County Search and Rescue, and the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. These teams set up an 18-square-mile grid search that basically covered anywhere and everywhere Jim could have gone. There was also air search done by two Black Hawk helicopters. The weather was okay. There was a light snow, but not enough to accumulate. So if Jim had left tracks, and look, to reiterate, it is about 8 to 10 feet of snow in most places on top of this mountain where Mm -hmm. they're at. Mm -hmm. If he walked anywhere, he would have left tracks. Yeah. They would not have been covered by the light falling of this snow. If he did use the split board skis, Mm -hmm. he still would have left fucking tracks. And they would have seen or heard something if it was like an avalanche or something. Well, he had an avalanche beacon in his bag that would have gone off if he was involved in an avalanche that would have led searchers to him. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. 
but there were no tracks that led anywhere. They would take some, they would follow some tracks, either footsteps or split board tracks. Like from where he started, right? Like from where he started, they would follow some they found and they would lead into the brush and stop. Hmm. Or they would double back and get back on the path. They never found what they considered to be Jim's tracks. Not okay. once. Yeah. It looked like Jim had just been picked off the mountain or had sunk into the earth. He had utterly vanished. In addition, no one interviewed who was on the mountain that day, other than Jim's friends, had seen him either going up or coming down the trail. This is a tourist town. It is tourist season in March. Mm -hmm. There were many people on the mountain that day that should have seen Jim on any of the trails he could have been on. Right. And no one saw him. Yeah. On Tuesday, March 18th, a huge snowstorm moved into the area, complicating search efforts. The search had to be suspended for 24 hours. On March 21st, with not one single trace of Jim, the search was officially suspended. The expense couldn't be justified and the weather was poor. And at this point, he'd been mis- missing nearly a week. And hope of- he'd been missing over a week, actually. Mm-hmm. Hope of finding Jim alive was gone. Mm-hmm. In addition, it's important to note that Search and Rescue uses Black Hawk helicopters, and these are equipped with infrared. On the first two days of the search, they should have been able to find Jim if he was alive, and on the first day, they'd have been able to find him even if he was deceased, because his body still would have been warmer than the surrounding environment. Right. Yet they found nothing. Mm -mm. Jim should have been seen. On April 3rd of 2014, three Backcountry skiers were in an area called Booth's Fall. This is approximately four and a half miles east of the trail that Jim went missing from. They found a body under a cliff that was 700 feet tall, and it was the body of Jim, and he had fallen off that cliff. Hmm. This area had been extensively searched both by searchers on the ground and from the air. The very spot his body was recovered from Mm -hmm. had been searched multiple times right weird Mm -hmm. if he was there during march 14th to march 21st he should have been found even if he was dead while he was only about four and a half miles from the trail he was supposed to be on that's as the crow flies (laughs) y'all over ground it would have required jim to climb over very steep cliffs and really intense terrain It makes no sense for Jim to go the way he did, even if he was lost. It would be intensely difficult, if not a bit impossible, for him to get to on foot. Yeah. But then sources can't agree on what trail Jim was on in the first place. Now, according to Jim's friends, he had separated willingly from the group and chose to go on his own against their wishes. This is what they told police. However, shortly after Jim went missing, one of Jim's friends told Jim's father that they were with Jim the whole time, but that it was a little strange and he was having a hard time remembering everything. Mm -hmm. He said that he was a little ahead of him. Jim was, Mm -hmm. but his friends remember being with Jim almost the entire way to Iceman's hut. And he can't seem to recall when Jim disappeared. Yeah. As I stated, Jim was an experienced hiker, yet he went off trail and missed several obvious turns off, turnoffs in clear weather. He kept going through very dense and difficult terrain to make it to Booth's Falls. There's no logical reason for him to do this. To be where he was, regardless of what trail he was on, mm-hmm. he would have had to have go off trail to go 1,200 feet uphill. He would have left a a well-established trail to go into dense wilderness. And as an experienced hiker, you wouldn't do that. Plus, if you were that lost, why wouldn't you take out your GPS device? Right. Or your cell phone? Uh Uh-huh. He had signal up there, by the way. Huh. Yeah. I don't know. Jim would have to cross a creek and then go down 800 feet in less than half a mile. That's how steep it was. Right. Like, you can't really traverse it. Mm -hmm. Vale would have been visible the entire time. The city. Yes, and all he would have had to done is kept walking down the trail. Yeah. But instead he went up. Hmm. If he's lost, why wouldn't he go towards Vale? He could have made it to the bottom of the mountain easily just following the city. Yeah. I don't know. But he didn't. In order for Jim to end up where he was... 
It would require him not to know he was off trail, despite his map and GPS saying otherwise. He would have had to just somehow blindly miss the entire city of Vale, which would have been easily visible where he was. And he would have had never gotten the idea to call for help or check with his friends or family, despite obviously getting lost. Mm -hmm. And lastly, he would have had to just walk straight off a cliff. Yeah. A cliff that was not obscured. Right. A cliff that was clearly there. It was clearly a cliff. It's not like you come up on it suddenly. There's a clearing. Here's a cliff. Yes. He would have known it was Booth's Falls. There was an ice fall there. It's called cliffs. Yeah. There's, There's falls. a sign. Yeah. Don't jump down this. When he was found, he had some things on him that just didn't make any sense. His avalanche beacon never went off, and it should have, even though he fell down a 700 foot slope. The cell phone in his backpack, when charged, worked perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. The cell phone or beacon weirdly didn't break. Jim was wearing black leggings, an undershirt, a, sh a shirt, gray socks, no coat or gloves, and his boots were missing. Hmm. His snowboard and helmet were crushed. In the backpack, they found his GPS. It hadn't been used. Coat and his phone. And all of these devices were fully charged and fully functional. Mm -hmm. His boots were never found. Hmm. So... You can go back to paradoxical undressing mm -hmm. if you want. It was cold that day. It was cold enough to get hypothermia. However, with Jim moving around and it hadn't been that long, and it, I think he died that first day. Mm -hmm. I really do. Yeah. Or they would have found him. Yeah. But he wouldn't. Paradoxical undressing doesn't involve just removing like a coat and neatly putting it in your backpack. Right. With your gloves. Yeah. And it never involved, they never take off their shoes. That is the last thing anybody would do, even in distress. Right. Because the, the fucking ground's going to eat your feet up. Yeah. Where did his, I mean, I guess I tried to think, okay, so his snowboard, he's on it. Yeah. And maybe falling, it got caught and it fell and it could have jerked his boot. It just, I don't see that happening. No. That's so silly. Then they would have found the boots. Mm -hmm. They never found the boots. Mm -mm. And, you know, like, just like the last case we covered, the guy's fucking boot was 75 feet up a tree. Right. And a snake. And that desiccated snake. Yeah. But what's strange is that just the little things that were missing, like, there was no food found in his backpack. Mm-hmm. Why not? He wasn't gone long enough to eat it. He was dead before he could eat the food in there. Right. No coat, and it was really cold. The coat was in his, in his backpack. Yeah. He clearly had gotten warm hiking around. And would put it back on later. That's why he put it in his backpack. That's not paradoxical undressing, is no, what I'm saying. I don't know. Yeah, I just think it's too cold to take your coat off, so I think the whole thing's weird. The whole thing's very strange. And like that no matter what trail he was on to get to where he was, from where he started, he would have had to go up many, many, many weird, crazy cliffs and hills. Yeah. He would have also had to descend something like nearly a thousand feet in less than half a mile. And I know from hiking experience when I was younger, you don't do that. That's too steep a terrain. Mm -hmm. And then he goes back up 1,200 feet after descending 800 to just jump off this cliff. And if people have said it was a possible suicide I don't think so. Mm -mm. He gave no indication. This was a trip he planned for a year with his friends. Mm -hmm. He was having a good time. Uh, everybody was in good spirits. When they, when I say they got mad at Jim, they just kind of like, oh man, don't wander off. You know? Yeah. You, know, you can't stop an adult. So, but then I focus on the part where his friend Bill told his Jim's father, we didn't split up, but we can't figure out why he just disappeared. Right. Like he was a little ahead of us, but not that far. We could see him until we couldn't. Mm -hmm. So, man, I don't even, I can't even, like, guess what would do this to him. No, I have no ideas on this one. Like, I feel like with the last guy we covered, the C's case, mm -hmm. his name was, like, Jacob or Jim or something, yeah. C's, that he clearly was, like, dropped out of a UFO. I mean, that's clearly what it looked like to me. Yeah. But for this one? Don't I mean, know. maybe. They could have. Fairies? I don't know. And, I mean, he was in a boulder field. Yeah. So it's just really bizarre. And I don't I don't know. We'll be covering some more cases like this. There's um there's a couple that are even weirder than this one, and I find this to be one of the weirdest. Right. I just have no ideas, so I don't I can't even make a snarky comment. But I also kind of wanted to talk about the like what I what is called the Oz effect with mm -hmm. missing four one one. Yeah. Because it happened here, supposedly, possibly. 
Like where there's a storm or something ahead of time? No, the Oz effect is where you don't feel like you're in Kansas anymore. People report feeling strange. You're in a weird place. You feel strange. You feel dizzy, Mm -hmm. disorientated, maybe a little disassociative. And that's why people can't remember exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's called the Oz effect. And that happened in this, I believe. Yeah, I don't think where they Jim were just the sort group. of like, da- yeah, you know, I mean, I've been walking in the woods and stuff and you sort of drift off mentally and then you look around, you're like, where the fuck, you know? And, j- like and the dude was gone. Yeah. And there have been reports of like all like wildlife and everything going completely silent mm-hmm. during these Oz effect moments, feelings of being watched. Yeah. Or like everything goes quiet except steps towards you in the woods oh that's bullshit yeah it's that kind of stuff so like i want i'm anti-hiking yeah they do say though if you want to eliminate the risk of going missing 411 yourself Uh carry a transponder yeah which is a gps device which jim had a gun and -hmm. bring a dog no although there have been people go missing with all them things on them too so i guess that doesn't work I say avoid the woods. Yeah. You don't what you need in there. More Girl, else. you don't need in there. Well, but that's right by our house. I know. You're not gonna go missing four one one there. Probably not. That would be really stupid. It would. Yeah. But yeah, so if you guys have any other missing four one one cases you're interested in and want me to cover, I certainly will. Uh I will not be covering the Dior Coons case. It's Claire's parents just killed him. Yeah. I mean nobody wants to say that because it sucks but i mean i'll never forget watching that missing 411 movie mm-hmm. and they're interviewing the family and i just turned to maris and i'm like oh my god they killed that kid yeah yeah uh, yikes and you know that's really when the missing 411 thing dropped off and that's because he fucked it up he, david polites is such a fucking hack mm-hmm. i want to grab him by the mustache and fight him yeah but you know what you guys want to do mm. Join our Patreon. Yeah, Patreon. Yeah. I'm going to be covering... Here's what I'm going to be covering this month when I can get Willow to come over. She has been very busy. She is working all the time. Yeah. Single mom thing going on. Very hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's what I will be covering. I'm going to be covering Gypsy Rose Blanchard outside of prison and outside of doing like that Lifetime movie. And she has shown her ass. Mm. And she's not behaving good. No. And there's been some information come out that I find very interesting. I'm sure me and Willow both will be covering the like Puff Daddy stuff, Mm -hmm. the Diddy stuff, the Diddly stuff, Diddler, Mm. Kid kid Diddler stuff. Mm. I don't want to, but I'm going to because it kind of goes back to the Tupac case that I covered, Mm. you know, his murder. Yeah. It's possible that he had involvement and I, I I suspect that he did. I believe it. Yeah. He's a nightmare, evil devil person Mm -hmm. full of demons. And then uh, I will be covering God. The O.J. Simpson trial. Mm. The trial itself was really interesting. Yeah. And so I wanted to cover that. And we're still doing 90s month. Right. The notorious 90s. Just so many good true crime cases. They did a lot of crime in the 90s. I they guess do they a lot always of crime do a lot all of crime. The time. Yeah, it's just all the time crime. But I feel like some of the most famous cases of all time yeah. have came from the 90s, like the O.J. Simpson trial, Lorena Bobbitt case. All that stuff, Bill the Menendez Clinton. brothers, yeah. uh, Versace's murder, yeah. all that stuff. So we're going to be covering that. And if you have any ideas, join our Discord and give me your suggestions. We love suggestions and often take them. Yeah. Uh, and in addition to joining our Discord, you could talk to me if you want. Yeah. And I will talk back unless Hello. I'm asleep or something. Yeah. Yeah. Maris is on there. Yeah, I'm in there. Yeah, and if you want his attention, you just do at Maris. Oh, yeah. And then it alerts him. And he's like, what is it? And I get scared. He gets scared, but he'll talk to you because I'll bully him. And then uh, you can get our merch. We It's good to be hoodie weather, okay? Yeah. And so you're going to get one of our hoodies. They're very soft, and they last a long time. The links to all of this stuff, including our coffee, if you're like, hey, I enjoyed this, here's $5, is uh, in the description of this podcast. And if I sound spacey and weird, it's because my allergies are making me die. Ugh, yep. We're both dying. Also, we we have another podcast. Yeah? Maris, do you want to tell them about your podcast? Well, it's Welcome to Reality with your host, me. Maris, and I talk about reality television. That's right. What are we covering right now? We're doing The Sister Wife, season 19. Yeah, Sister... This is the most latest season because, you know, Cause it's, it's the most relevant. latest season. Yeah. Well, and it's Sister Wife because all There's the wives that went in the Thunderdome, only one came out, and that yeah. was Robin. Only one remains, yeah. Yeah. 
She's the Highlander of wives, as you said. I think she'll defeat Cody. I think she'll probably vor him or something. Okay. Well, on that note, we're going to go. Yeah. And if all you can do to support this podcast is listen, thank you. Thank you. It's for you. No. Oh. Good night. Bye. Us on your social media platform of choice. Linktree slash cruelty has all of the links. Check out our Patreon for exclusive episodes, merch, ad free episodes, live ghost hunts, and much more. Please be sure to subscribe. New episodes are uploaded weekly. Thank you so much. See you next time. Music and production by Lee.